Um, so on your way out to, uh, after services, go by the table, check out the items that are there, uh, some great stuff all from Uganda, and uh, all the proceeds will go to support UCSS. Speaking of awesome ministries and things that are taking place here at Dunville is um, back in April, uh, we began a Hispanic ministry here at Dunville Christian Church. Some of you may know, some of you may not know. On Sunday afternoons at 2 o'clock, we actually, uh, Pastor Marino leads a church, a uh, Hispanic ministry here at the church over in the Upstreet Theater each and every Sunday. Um, and what's been happening over the course of the months, they've been trying to give it a trial run, see how things work. And we're really excited to share with everybody on August 27th, is the launch, where it's a Saturday uh, evening at 6 o'clock, we're going to have a launch service of that Hispanic ministry. And so you all are more than welcome and invited to join us on August 27th at 6 p.m. over in the community center for the Hispanic ministry launch here at Dumble Christian Church. And so we're really excited about that. And Pastor Marino will be speaking, and it'll all be in Spanish, the whole service. So Now, can everybody, you just say what you just said in English? Spanish? In Spain, no, no. But I could, we can have uh, Marshall work on us uh, the next few weeks that the whole entire worship service, we can make it in Spanish for us, and he'd love to do it. Well, this last week, uh, we've, Michael and I, we took uh, four others with us, and we went to Eastern Kentucky to go serve this last week, and we joined up with our uh, partnering ministry, IDES, which is International Disaster Emergency Services uh, out job. of Indiana. And uh, we were, uh, it was just, I don't even know how the words, how would you describe it? Was it was surreal. When you go in there and you see what has happened and the devastation that occurred. And when we went into the area and we uh, went in uh, to help a, a family that was in need, and their home, it, and this just kind of blew me away, their home is 12 blocks high. So just imagine that for a minute. They live in an area where it normally floods. They're used to some flooding, but their home was... 12 blocks Didn't high. they say 12 cement blocks high And the already. highest that it's ever hit, this home was built in the 1950s, was one block. Yeah. All right, so they, they felt pretty, pretty good about it. But it's them. never entered their home. This time, it entered their home two feet. Mm -hmm. Was it two feet up on the walls? And so it, it yeah. just destroyed everything. So yeah. we went in, and we, we helped them get everything out. We had to take up the floors and the walls and everything, and they basically had to start from the studs, you know, and, and work his way out. It is but so sad to see what's taking place, and many of us, yeah. we, we may or may not know, I don't know if anybody's been following or not on the news, but the sad thing about this whole situation is that me and these people, and even in the area over in eastern Kentucky, there's not many places that you they have hotels or places to stay other than with family. And so the people that are impacted... Um, many of them are actually living inside their homes because the vandalism is so great. And the National Guard is trying to do their best to keep things secure. But these people that are over there, they're, they're much like we are. And what I mean by that is this, is that they'll do anything to help their neighbor, love on their community, and do anything. And it's just absolutely just heartbreaking and devastating. Because even when we walked in there that day, there was one family that welcomed us to, to come join us out of this neighborhood that we were in serving. And this family, um, we walk into this home, and I was just, I, I was speechless for 10 minutes and, and just, just complete shock because they were just crying and didn't know where to start and everything. I was put in charge of this project, and I just walked in there and said, you know, everything's got to go. Your kitchen cabinets, there's mold behind it. They said, you sure? I said, yeah, there's going to be mold behind it, and, and you've got to take out the walls, and, you know, everything that you said, it was just like, it was just more bad news to them. And sitting in that moment and just trying to figure out what we can do, how to help the family, a lot of the other families in the community, they, they didn't want any help because they didn't really trust anybody. They didn't trust if anybody was going to go in there and steal things that were theirs. They, they don't know um, the hearts behind people. And so how the National Guard and the local authorities have divided up 
uh, they divide up the help by, um, you know, these nonprofit organizations that come in. They break up the communities where everybody's getting touched, so they're not, they're not overlapping. So International Disaster Emergency Services is in charge of this little community that we're in, along with three others in the state that was impacted. And so we're over there working. This one family in the whole entire community allowed IDES to come in and work. Toward the end of the day, something crazy took place. And we, we watched it that the neighbors started coming up and asking for help mm -hmm. because they saw that we were trusted and that we were there to help them. And to me, that just is so heartbreaking. But we know what that's like. It's hard to trust. It's hard to understand what people's motives and their intentions are, why they're coming in and doing what they are what they're doing. And so I had an opportunity to talk with uh, Mason and a few people that are directors of the IDES organization. And what we're going to do as a church is that we are going to help to a certain dollar, uh, uh, dollar amount. Um, we haven't figured out what that is yet, but we can tell you this much, is that anybody that would like to donate this week to help out, we're going to adopt a family over in Eastern Kentucky. And we're going to help as much as we possibly can um, to help them build back to what that looks like. And so um, we're going to do that. So if you would like to donate and give above and beyond um, uh, your typical tithe uh, out in the Welcome Center, um, we'll have a bucket out there that says Eastern Kentucky on it, and you can uh, drop a love offering into the bucket after the services. I think it's going to be a great thing because it, when we went in there, of course, it, we were just in one home doing it, and I'm thinking all along while we're doing it, like, well, I'd like to do this for everybody in the community. I'm like, I want to help everybody. Uh, but again, as our fearless leader here, uh, Derek, has told me, he said, what you want to do for everybody, do for one. And that's what we're doing. We're going to, like you said, we're going to adopt a family. And anything that you give will go to that family to help them out. And we will bless one family. And it will mean the world of difference to that family. And so if you know of any other churches, uh, that's one of the things, like if you talk to any of the organizations, like even Samaritan Purse or any of the other big organizations, they're asking churches to do that, to adopt a family. Because the, the need is so great, and when these natural disasters uh, take place throughout our country and across the world, um, that is the way that we can get, always give back, is by adopting a family, and they'll make sure that those funds go toward that. Amen. And so today, um, to kind of wrap up our announcement time, what's... Uh, bring it back a little bit. There may be something that you may hear today during our service and uh, maybe asking you have questions and so we call that your next step and so if anybody in here has a has a question or maybe they want to take their next step in their faith please don't hesitate to come see uh, myself uh, Michael or Pastor Derek. Um, I have a lot of questions. You do have lots of questions. You have <laughs> lots of questions. There's a lot of times we can't get anything done around here because you have lots of questions, Michael. What are you saying? Um, <sighs> are you saying that I ask a lot of questions? Yes. All right. So with that said, I've got what, a question for you. What kind of questions do you think I ask? I've got a question for you. <laughs> yes. they're, they're not annoying questions. They're very good questions. And I think it helps us be able to better answer everybody else's questions. So I've got a question for you. Yes. Would you open us this morning with a word of prayer? I sure would. All right, thanks. I sure would. Let us pray. Father God, thank you so much that we can come this morning into your house and be with our church family. We can come in and we can worship with our church family. We can um, listen to a message from the word of God this morning. We pray that you be with Brother Derek as he brings that message this morning. We pray for our worship team as they bring the music this morning. And we pray for this young lady that's baptized this morning. And we praise you and we thank you for your salvation, for your forgiveness. Um, we thank you for giving us your son Jesus to die on the cross of Calvary. He shed his blood for us. And it's in his holy name we pray. Amen. Well, let's stand and worship this morning together. You got me. <laughs> Marshall and I have this little thing back and forth with each other. He'll, right before we get up on stage most of the time, he'll go, you got it. You got it. I'm like, no, you got it. 
So he got you got me this morning. So we're going to worship the Lord together today. Come on, this is it. Let's sing this morning. Let's worship God. When darkness tries to roll over my bones, come on, we know it. So let's sing it out. When sorrow comes to steal the joy of, when brokenness and pain is all I know, come on, sing. I won't be shaken. No, I won't be shaken. My fear doesn't stand the chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand the chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand the chance when I stand in your love. Oh, no longer has a place. Here we go. And I am not a captive to the light. I'm not afraid. Oh, I'm, I'm not, not afraid to leave my past behind. No, I won't be shaken. No, I won't be shaken. My fear doesn't stand the chance when I stand in your love. Stand the chance when I stand in your love. My feet doesn't stand the chance when I stand in your love. Oh, there's power that can break off every chain. Here we go. There's power that can end me out of When I stand in your love, my fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. Oh, I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. My fear doesn't stand a chance when I stand in your love. church let's continue to praise this morning Oh 
here we go, church. You heard it. Let's sing it again. Worthy of every song we could ever sing. Worthy of all the praise we could ever bring. Yes. Worthy of every breath we could ever bring. We live for you. Oh, we live for you, Jesus. Jesus, the name above every other name. church when holy there is no one like you there is none beside you open up my eyes in wonder and show me who you are and fill me with your heart and lead me in your love to die Open up my eyes in wonder. 
We got one more song. Let's talk about who, who God is because he is every single thing to us. Let's sing it up. opportunity you've given us today to be in your house of praise, to worship your most holy name. 
We thank you for the freedom. We thank you for the opportunity we're about to witness today. And that the heaven is rejoicing because of this opportunity we're about to witness with our own eyes. Of somebody giving themselves, giving their lives to you in baptism. It's such a privilege to worship with your people. And to listen to them sing. And open up their hearts and emotionally connect to the words that inspires us to to be more closer to you as we sing. Father God, thank you so much for loving us. Thank you so much for guiding us. And thank you so much for sending your son to die on the cross for our sins. And as we take the emblems this morning that symbolizes our history in this world, we stop, pause, reflect, get on our knees if we have to for what you did for us. We thank you and we praise you. And as Brother Derek brings your message this morning on our starting point, may you inspire him, give him words from on high, and may preach to your church. And when time is no longer, give us a humble part with you in your eternal kingdom, because in Jesus' most precious name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Everything has a beginning. It's a driving force in our human experience. Every person, every idea, every journey starts somewhere. Whether it's one small step in a new direction or a catalyst that ignites a spark It's a moment when, from this point forward, nothing will ever be the same. It's not always comfortable. It's not always easy. But it is a start. online. We're glad that you are uh, viewing in through the uh, screen that you are looking at right now. Uh, 
today we're starting a brand new series, and it is called Starting Point, and it does begin with a very simple principle, a very simple principle, and that, that principle is this. Everything in life has a starting point. Everything in life has a starting point. In fact, you know this, you had a starting point, right? I mean, the fact that you're here means that you had a start. Now, your start may have been planned, <clears throat> And like some, it may have been unplanned, right? But we're glad that we're all here. Uh, we, we've all had a starting point, however that may have come about. You may have been, the starting point for you may have been the, the medical marvels of science, right? Like right now. Um, and that's a cool thing too. Did you know that your romance has a starting point? You know, your career had a starting point. Your parenting had a starting point. I mean, everything in life that we encounter, that you experience, has a starting point, but sometimes we don't pause long enough, and we may know that. You may think about that, maybe something that you ponder, but the thing that maybe we don't think about oftentimes is that our faith has a starting point too. Our faith, just like everything else in life, has a starting point. And for most of us, our starting point of our faith began when we were children, right? In your childhood, you were raised by people that influenced you to have beliefs and and a system of belief, things that that expand beyond what you see with your own eyes, what you experienced with your physical body. But you had wonders and dreams. And this faith system, this belief system, was to believe in things that you couldn't see and maybe... You were influenced by that. Maybe it was a Sunday school class. Maybe it was, you know, the neighbor next door. Maybe it was your grandparents or your parents or however that may be. But one thing probably in this area that we have in common for the most part is that most of us have a very similar faith framework, if you will, from our childhood. Um, Most of us would say that in this area, especially through the Bible Belt and and many years uh, ago as this was established, we would say that the influence of our life was mainly a Christian influence. That's what we would say. But you have to remember that around the world, that's not the case. That around the world in many places, and you can barely see it on your screen, you can see it here a little better, but I've just put a few of the world's religions behind this word of Christian, the thing that we identify with. And from your childhood framework of faith, maybe this was the thing you heard about. You had heard about Jesus and the church and, and God as it pertains to you know, the Christian faith, and maybe for some of you, you know, so your, your faith journey began with a church or your family visiting a church, or maybe if you're Jewish, it began in a synagogue for people that were Muslim, and, and they, you know, follow Islam that began in a mosque, and we could go on and on about the faith journeys and the framework of faith of so many people in this world, but this is what we identify with a lot in our area, right, wouldn't you say? And the things that you were taught as a young kid, or the things at least maybe you heard that Christians believe in this childhood faith, and I don't mean childlike faith, it's totally different, I'm talking childhood faith, are things like God is good, right? You've, you've probably heard that before, God is good. In, in fact, if you were in a preschool, and much like the preschool here at the church, they sing a little song sometimes at their dinner time, remember what it is? God is great, God is good, let us thank him for our food. It never made sense to me. You know, I don't know why, but anyway, you got it. God is great. God is good. Let us thank him for our food is what the kids will say before they have their meal. And maybe you have said the same things. I know I grew up with that same song. Or you maybe have heard things like God rewards good and he punishes evil. And this was like a framework of of the structure that your parents may have used for obedience and discipline. It's like you should be good, right? Or you, you, you should not be bad. And here's the reason why. And you were taught that God rewards good things. And that he punishes evil things. And then maybe you heard that God answers prayer. And and most of you grew up with this kind of framework of believing God answers prayer. And this is all good stuff. And I believe these things too. And and, and as we should. But we have a context to this. And for some people, they don't have a very strong context for this. And they were raised maybe around the awareness of Christianity and this childhood framework of faith. But then something happened in their life. It's something that happens inevitably to all of us if we make it that long. Adulthood set in. And when adulthood set in, when you were a child, you may have had doubts and concerns and and you may have wondered like, well, you know, okay, I I hear about people are telling me these Bible stories in Sunday school. And for many people, it seems like a story, right? Because that's the way it was presented as these stories, much like many other stories that you experienced as a child. But when adulthood kicks in, the realities and the rigors of adulthood kicks in and the challenges of adulthood kicks in, sometimes those doubts begin to resurface, those wonders begin to resurface. And if we're not given the right framework, if we don't 
find, as we'll say, a new starting point or a, another starting point as an adult, sometimes that childhood framework of faith doesn't last very long in adulthood. And we're finding right now, statistically, that one out of every three, and it may have even increased this year, one out of every three students that goes, attends college that's a Christian abandons their faith because of their involvement in college where other uh, beliefs and systems of beliefs are attacking what they were taught to believe as a child. Isn't that interesting? One in three. Those are not good statistics for children. And in fact, we're finding that once a person reaches a certain age, 18 to 21, that the statistic uh, probability of them becoming a Christian is very, very, very low at that point in their life. And the reason why is, again, because of the realities of adulthood. You grew up believing those good things, and, and maybe you still do, and I hope that you do. But in adulthood, we have questions at times, and sometimes there aren't answers or aren't adequate answers, we think. And we say, well, if God is good, then where is this good God in a bad world, right? I've had this question posed to me so much. If God is so good, then why does he allow evil to take place in the world? It's a legitimate question, especially if you're on the receiving side of that evil. Or maybe you heard God rewards good and punishes evil, but then why do good people suffer? And why does it seem that people who are doing wrong things or your framework of wrong things seem to be rewarded or they get away with it, right? Why is this happening? Or if God answers prayers, well, listen, I prayed quite a bit, right, for my mom or my dad. Maybe this was you. There was a health situation, and you prayed and you prayed, and you let God know what was on your heart. But why does it seem like God's answering everybody else's prayers, but he doesn't answer my prayers? And those questions can become problematic for people when the starting point of their faith, the foundation of their faith, doesn't continue to grow, just like you did in maturing intellectually, Maturing physically and age and, and your experience. As you grow, your faith must grow too. That's the whole point of spiritual growth. You can't say, well, there was that one moment, you know, in my childhood and I accepted all things and I believed all things at that point and I haven't really, you know, I just have this faith. I believe in God. I'm good. And unfortunately, we find that you're not good. Your faith has to grow. Spiritual growth is important. Discipling is so important. And we see it modeled in Jesus' life all throughout his ministry. It is unmistakable. You cannot replace it. Now, I know that I'm not alone in thinking this way and in, in seeing this happen in people's lives because I experience it as well as other pastors throughout this nation and around this world. But there are books written about this. You can find many, many books of people and their experience with faith. And one such book caught my attention. It's called The Case for God, and it's written by Karen Armstrong. And she has a quote within this book that stood out to me as I'm processing this that really explains how many adults feel about faith and why many adults abandon their faith once they hit the rigors and challenges of adulthood. She says, many of us have been left stranded, like out here on our own, with an incoherent concept of God. It's very interesting. She would put it that way, incoherent. It's like it didn't make sense. We learned about God about the same time we were told about <clears throat> SC. I won't say it too loud. Don't want to ruin anything for people, right, I guess. But we learned about God about the same time we learned about some fairy tales, Right? And she goes on to say, but while our understanding of the Santa Claus phenomenon evolved and matured, our theology remained somewhat infantile. And now, this is serious because Paul talks about this in the New Testament, right? When he says to the older generation, by now you ought to be teachers of other people, but you're still infants and you're still needing milk. You should be eating meat by now. You should be knowing more than just the foundations. Why do we have to keep coming back to the foundations of your faith? You should be progressing and spiritually moving so that you can teach other people. And Karen hits the nail on the head. Our faith is infantile if we don't take those steps. And if there are those out there who aren't maturing and being the ones who pour themselves into and impart themselves, it's discipling. That's what it is, disciple making at its best. She continues and she says, so it's not surprisingly, not surprisingly then, when we attained intellectual maturity, many of us rejected the God we had inherited and denied that he even existed. We inherited this God our parents taught us about, our culture framed us in. But then as we became an adult, we made our own decisions. We got outside of that bubble. We got outside of that system. They got introduced to new things, new things that brought questions and brought conflict, tension within them, doubts. And when there wasn't an adequate context for them at that point, 
then many people fall to the wayside. And maybe that's something that you struggle with. Maybe that's something a family member of yours struggles with. I know it's certainly going to be something that your teenage children are going to battle. And you need to be ready for the fight. That's why we're talking about this series. As adults and as we transition, as we talked about a few weeks ago, out of the first decade of life where children are dependent upon their parents, in that second decade of life, they are going to move their dependency to someone else. And you and I need to be working diligently to ensure that their dependency doesn't go to another person or another ideology or or some type of belief system beyond what we know to be the truth, that their dependency needs to be on their heavenly father through Christ. Adults often need a new starting point, and that's not a bad thing. It's not saying that the starting point of our faith as children was a bad thing. That's not what I mean. But it means that we need to apply and bring in context to deeper understanding of Scripture and of Christ and the things of God. So through this series, here's what we're going to do. We're going to ask a question. What if we approached our faith as if we didn't know anything? What if we approached our faith just for a few weeks as if... We had never heard the story of Christ. We had never experienced the stories of the Old Testament in Sunday school, right? What if we didn't know anything? Where would we begin? And that's what this series is about. If you're a seeker of faith, if you're a starter in your faith, or maybe even a returner to faith after some time, or maybe you've had faith for a very long time, this series is for you. This information is for you. And we want you to settle in and over the next few weeks participate in this, doing the homework each week, asking the right questions and wrestling these questions and the answers to the ground and and showing some steps, proving ourselves to be in pursuit of our God. Now, for most people, and especially in our area, where they want to begin is with the Bible, right? Especially with Christianity because that's our context. You're probably not going to pick up the Quran because you're not super familiar with the Quran, right? You're not going to pick up the Vedas of Hinduism because you're, you probably know nothing, didn't even know there was something called Vedas of Hinduism, right? You're not going to pull up the tenets of Buddhism and, and listen to the teachings of Siddhartha Gautama because you haven't experienced that. That's not your culture. And we could go on and on about all of those religions on the screen a moment ago. We start with the Bible in our area because that is culturally and that is historically what has influenced everything in our world. And I'll get to that in a little while. And I want to tell you that starting with the Bible is not a bad thing. That is actually a good thing because that is the method of which uh, we now have access to information of things and events that happened nearly you know, 2,000 years ago, 4,000 years ago, even up to 6,000 years ago, we believe. The Bible, and I believe this to be true, is the Word of God. I want to go ahead and state that because some statements I'm going to make in a minute, you could might take the wrong way, but don't, don't take them the wrong way. Let me explain. The Bible is the Word of God. I believe that with all my heart. Do you? The Bible is inspired of God. Everything in it was inspired. In the same way that God is inspiring people even today, understand that Peter and Paul and James and John and Matthew and Luke, and we could go on and on, Mark, all of these people were inspired in their writings. Moses in the oral traditions, Solomon through his Proverbs and Ecclesiastes, and then you have David and Moses and other song leaders in the book of Psalms, and you have so much history and you have so many prophets. All of them were inspired of God and it makes one complete, coherent story, one history all combined together, and I believe that it's infallible. Now, you may say, well, what about this translation and that translation, and they use this word, and that? that's not what I mean. We can use multiple words to mean different things, but the meaning of Scripture and the story and the thread of Christ is true throughout Scripture, and it is infallible, Period. It speaks of God's redemption story through Christ, and you can find Jesus in every single book, every single piece of history, every single letter written by the Apostle Paul. But the thing that we do with the Bible is um, what we do with it, not what's in it, but what we do with it sometimes is the problem, how we engage with it. Many people want to start with, well, the Bible says, and that's great if you have context and you trust the Bible. Just like Matthew and Michael were talking a minute ago, people are going to eastern Kentucky to help people whose, whose houses have been flooded, but you can't deny that some people go to areas like that not to help, but actually to, to seek their own interests, right? 
try to carry off what they can. They seek to harm, and that's something, sadly, that exists. Well, the same perception, you could say, is, is given by, and, and many people have, or is, is allowed by many people in their perception of, of what Scripture is about. You say, well, the Bible says, and they say, well, well, wait a minute, you can't start there because that doesn't mean anything to me. You're like, yeah, but you don't know the story of, and they say, no, I don't know the story that you're talking about. Maybe they don't have the framework you have or the, 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 the foundation you have or the family that you had that taught them those stories. And you start, well, the Bible says, but for a lot of adults, the Bible says is not an adequate starting point or even a returning point for many adults. Because they don't have the same concepts you do in the same context that you do. The Bible says, in fact, though, what's good news was never even intended to be the starting point of our Christian faith. You do understand that. For over 250 years before what we know as the Bible even existed, their faith and the early disciples and early Christians was unprecedented. They believed in Christ long before there was a book that they could carry around. Now, many of them had access through synagogues to Scripture, to Torah, to the writings of the prophets, but you didn't take it home. They were big scrolls, and they were stored away and kept, and if you wanted to read one, you had to ask for access, and most common people never even had access to that. It had to be a very special occasion. You needed to be a religious leader or a student of a rabbi to have access within that rabbi's name to even be able to read it for yourself. And then on top of that, most common people couldn't even read and write. So you were dependent upon someone else to teach you. So long before what we say the Bible says in the Old Testament and New Testament being bound together, it first appears around 250 A.D. Keep in mind, we think that Jesus died around 33 to 34 A.D. For 200 years, people followed Jesus, and the church spread like wildfire. In fact, about 25 years into the church, it said in the very chapter we're going to read today that this church, this group of people, this gathering, they turned the whole world upside down with their teaching. How powerful is that? Because the Word of God is more than just words in a book. It's words that are inscripted and written on a heart. And it's not done so by how eloquent a pastor like myself or a speaker or evangelist or whoever can speak the words of Christ or the teachings of Jesus or the words that we find in Scripture. It has nothing to do with the eloquence of the words or my ability to make it simple enough to understand. It has everything to do with the inspiration and the moving of the Holy Spirit. My job is just to speak a true statement. The true statement then testifies with the Holy Spirit and people's lives are changed or they're not. And that's not my doing and it's not your doing. It's not my responsibility and it's not your responsibility. It's the responsibility of God to change the hearts and minds of people. And we're going to see that in the story today. The foundation of our faith wasn't something that was written it's even better than that. It was written about, but it was something that happened. It was a moment. It was the event of the resurrection of Jesus because you understand that the teachings of Jesus mean nothing if the resurrection of Jesus didn't occur. The foundation of our faith is not that we have a Bible bound together, but it's that there was a resurrection of a man who lived, who died, rose again. And his teachings then were punctuated by the fact that he lives he lives even today. So where we're going with this is we're going to look at a story from the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was known as Saul. Many of you know this. Maybe you don't, and that's the whole point of this, so let me tell you. Saul was a Pharisee, a Jewish Pharisee. He was around the time that Jesus was in his ministry. Saul would have been young, though, at this time, probably a teenager, maybe in his late teens. At the end of Jesus' ministry and at the launch of the church, we find this figure, Saul, um, coming to life in Scripture. And his name is brought in in a very unfortunate circumstance for a man that would be stoned to death. A man that would be chosen in the church to become a servant in the church. But unfortunately, Saul had a different, um, a different outcome for him, a different agenda. We learn that this young man is stoned to death by the religious leaders because of his preaching of the word of God, of preaching about the resurrection of Jesus and, and bringing in Old Testament. And then it says that Saul was there holding the coats of the people, stoning the man to death. Saul then uh, appeals to uh, Jerusalem 
and he appeals to the high priest, and he gets access to, he gets the right to go around like a, a, a little, you know, I always attribute it to this, but in, in World War II, you had the Gestapo that would go around and hunt out Jewish people and, and lead them to their death. And this was exactly what Saul was doing. And he would go around the area stamping out churches, these little gatherings of believers like they were ant hills. But he would go to stomp one out, and then they would do exactly what ants would do. They would scatter to the next place. And, and actually, the persecution of the church led to the dis distribution of the church and the spread of the church, which was all part of God's plan, too. And one day, as Saul is going to Damascus on his way, he's going to persecute more believers. He has this encounter with Jesus, Saul says, that changed his life forever. It left him blind. And he had an encounter. He met the resurrected Christ. And over the period of a few years, Saul would learn about Jesus, about God's plan, about the church. It would be incredible. He had a friend named Barnabas. His name means encouragement. <laughs> the church needed encouragement when Saul showed up, or Paul now as his name would be. He would show up to a church and say, hey, I mean, they would say, oh, we know who you are and you need to leave, right? They were fearing for their life because this was the man who was leading to the murder of the church. Barnabas, the encourager, no, you can trust this man now. He's met Jesus. Think about it. Paul was showing up to churches, seeing children and young adults whose parents he had probably had put to death. How would you respond? So Paul, <clears throat> Jesus gives him a mission. He says, well, I've given my disciples, the apostles at that time, the mission to go and preach and teach to the Jews of the area and to the ends of the world as well. I want you, Paul, to take this message to the Gentiles, those that are not of Jewish faith. And he would travel around the Mediterranean rim of Greece and Turkey and Rome. And he would preach this gospel, this news of Jesus and his resurrection to the people. It's recorded for us in what we call the book of Acts, which was written by Luke, who was a physician, a Gentile physician, who evidently heard the message that Paul was preaching and come to faith in Christ. And he says that he wanted to detail an account so that people could come to belief as well about Christ. And in the book of Acts, we learn about the beginning journeys of the, or the opening of the church and beginning journeys of Paul, some incredible information there. So it's a historical account. And it's kind of a biography, if you will, of Luke talking about his journeys as he traveled with Paul, or it's a biography or an autobiography, I don't remember. Some of you English people, you got that. But where Paul ends up finding himself at this point where we're looking, um, Acts chapter 17, I believe, is in the city of Athens, which many of you know about the city of Athens. You're familiar with Greece and Athens and the Olympics and all those types of things, right? And in the ancient city of Athens, Paul finds himself debating with ancient philosophers, ancient philosophers. Athens was known for its philosophy. It was the epicenter of thought and wonder and really religion for the Greek people. At this time, though, it was a Greco-Roman world. It was a Greek culture immersed in and also with a Roman rule. And so you had the combination of Greek and Roman gods, and sometimes they were interchanged. It was very interesting how people would adapt and adopt certain beliefs. But they believed in a pantheon of gods, many gods. A god, you know, Zeus, who would cre you know, create all things, and Hera, and Poseidon, and Ares, or, or you know, Mars Hill is one of the things we're going to talk about. And, and you would have all of these different Jupiter, as, as Rome would come to call some of them, and Mars. And all of these gods, and you're probably familiar with them. You've seen them, you've heard about them, maybe even learned about them in school. But these ancient philosophers, what they would do is just sit around and, and talk about well, what if, right? The wonders of the world. Well, Paul rolls into town, and he finds himself debating with these people over their pantheon of gods because he wants to teach them about the one true God. In fact, covering the city of Athens were altars, just much like this one that I'm showing you here, an altar to a god all over the city of Athens, as we're going to see in the scripture in just a minute. And Paul would see these, and it would move him, move him to action as he would see these altars. And there would be statues and temples, which I'll show you in a moment as well. But one of the things that Paul's going to point out, one of the things we're going to learn from this story is that human curiosity regarding the existence of God is universal. You find it all over the world. People have been wondering about the existence of God for centuries and from the very beginning. And this is no different for us. I know that you have a curiosity too. So let's dive into this story and see what we can learn from this 
this situation with Paul. Acts 17 is where we're going, starting with verse 16. It says, while Paul was waiting for them, he's talking about Timothy and Silas. They've been traveling together. They were in Berea, which is another place in Greece, and, and Paul was actually ran out of Berea. They were going to kill him. And so they run him out of Berea, but he leaves Timothy and Silas behind because Paul wasn't just about showing up and converting believers, okay? He wanted Timothy and Silas to be men who would stay behind and teach people so that they would grow in their faith because that's what true discipling looks like. That's the model that Jesus gave us. So he says, Paul was waiting for them, Timothy and Silas in Athens. He was greatly distressed to see that the city was full of idols. And so as Paul enters Athens, you know, leaving Berea, he's looking around, and all of these idols and statues and temples are all over. And something happens within Paul. He's like, I should wait on my brothers, you know, I should wait on my guys. But I don't think I can, right? Like, this is just too much. These people need to hear the message of Jesus. And so... We learn, Luke tells us, he reasoned in the synagogue with both Jews and God-fearing Greeks. Now, you have to understand, the reason he went to the synagogue would be much like saying, I'm coming to a church, so to speak. I'm going to the religious people, Jewish people that he had context with, and he would teach them. He would use scripture and teach them. He would talk about the Old Testament. We learn this because he did the same thing in Berea. He would bring up Old Testament stories and scripture and reveal to them the truth about God. They had context. They had grown up with the Old Testament, the Torah, and the prophets, right, and the law. They, they had grown up with this. They knew about it so he could converse with them. It says that he, both Jews and God-fearing Greeks, that meant Greeks that had converted, converted to Judaism, as well as in the marketplace. Now, this was just open among anybody, religious or non-religious, day by day with those who happened to be there. So Paul's just chilling out in the marketplace. He's striking up conversations and gathering people and starting to teach about Jesus. We learn that he's teaching about Christ and the resurrection, the gospel. It says that a group of Epicurean, that means uh, these, these philosophers meant uh, they were all about embracing your desires and emotions. You should live to the fullest, but you don't want to have any pain, okay? We just, we want to live and be happy, and you need to embrace your emotions. And then another group of Stoic philosophers, they, they wanted you to control your emotions. They're like, you know, you need to just be kind of placid. You don't need to embrace your emotions. You need to be a, a virtuous person by the law and just be rigid, you know, that kind of idea. So two completely different trains of thought. Both of them did not believe much in an afterlife or resurrection of the dead. Let me say that. And so both of them didn't really believe in an eternal judgment kind of idea either. And so you've got these two ancient philosophies, both of them who began to debate with Paul as he's teaching about the resurrection of Jesus, this new God, by the way, that is presented to them. And, and this is something, you know, totally, totally new to their hearing. Continues and says, some of them asked, what is this babbler trying to say, babbling? We don't understand the words that he's speaking. We don't understand these stories that he's telling. He's just babbling. We can't make sense of this. Others remarked, he seems to be advocating foreign gods. Now, why is this important? Because in Athens during this time, and especially in the rule of Rome, you couldn't just go around teaching your own version of some religion. You weren't given the freedom to do that because what they had found is Joe would come in from out of town and he would be telling everybody about, you know, the sun god, so, so to speak. There was actually a god that was closely relinked to uh, Jesus later on called Sol Invictus. This was the sun god, you know, and the son of God kind of idea. It was very twisted and warped. But this guy came in, taught people about this, rallied troops, raised an army, created civil unrest, and then Rome would have to just come in and squash it like a bug. But it would create so much death and so much tension in, in life and in society that people just said, well, we're not going to let you do that anymore. If you're going to teach a new idea, you got to come talk to us about it first, and then we'll determine as a council of whether or not you can continue to teach the things you're teaching. You know, are you going to be a threat to our order here, because especially with Rome, if they thought you were worshiping a different king other than Caesar, then that was an insurrection and you would die, and that would be crucifixions that would take place down the roads of Rome. It would not be a pretty sight, and it happened all throughout history. So what we learn here, he's advocating foreign gods, but what Paul was actually teaching them, he goes on to say in verse 18, he was preaching the good news about Jesus and the resurrection of Christ. 
Verse 19 continues and says, Then they took him and brought him to a meeting. They brought him to a meeting. This is the meeting of that council of the Areopagus. This is called Mars Hill. This was a big rock, we'll see it in just a second, um, where they believe that uh, Ares was put on trial. These are the gods, the pantheons. Ares was put on trial for killing Poseidon's son. And this rock was a very sacred place to them. And so here you see this particular rock, the Areopagus is what they call it. And if you're looking through this view, you're looking out at the city of Athens and you're looking at places where you would have seen statues and altars and, and all sorts of things. But if you reverse your view, standing right here, remember this tree, here's that same tree standing right here where that marker was at. If you reverse your view, now you're looking at the Acropolis, which was a, a great temple that was dedicated to the gods of, of Greece, right? And, 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 other, and there were multiple temples. There was a bunch of temples. Greece, Athens is one of the most amazing cities in the world. I wish that I could go one day, in fact, just to see these things, these massive buildings that were constructed during this time. But this is the very rock that Paul was standing on with this council. And they would begin to interrogate him. Here's what they said. They said, you are bringing up some very strange ideas to our ears. And we would like to know what they mean. Answer for yourself. Speak to us. Tell us what's going on. We've never heard this stuff before. So then it says, Paul stood up in the Areopagus, and he said, People of Athens, I see that in every way you are very religious. Now, I'm not sure that was a positive statement, right? I think from Paul's tension that he had with this group of people, he's looking out, and he's like, you all are, are kind of over-religious, right? Like you're hyper-religious. You've got altars and statues and temples everywhere for all sorts of gods. I mean, this is overwhelming. He says, for as I walked around in your city and looked carefully at the objects of worship, I even found an altar with this inscription, to an unknown God. Isn't that interesting? Oh, here's the statue of Hera. We get that, right? And the statue of Zeus. That's, that makes sense. The unknown God. In fact, how this came about, it's kind of a squirrel, but you'll like this. Epimenides was a philosopher who at one time decided the way they were going to determine uh, gods in this Greek world is they were going to just release some sheep, right? And, and after some wars and things that happened, he was going to release some sheep into the city. And wherever the sheep laid down to rest, they would, they would make an offering right there. What, whatever altar that they got to. If they, if they came to the statue of Hera, then we were going to make an offering to Hera. If they got to the statue of so-and-so, we are going to make an offering of them. But what happened to the sheep that would just show up in the middle of a field and just lay down? They'd say, well, we believe that we need to set up an altar right here to a God we don't know about. We'll make an offering right here. In fact, that very altar that I showed you, wouldn't you know, is the altar, one of them, to the unknown God that Paul would have talked about. The inscription here writes, you know, an altar to an unknown God. So, Paul looks at them and says, I mean, you've got all these, these temples and all these statues. You've even got some you don't even have a name on them. You don't even know who you're, you're worshiping, right? You don't even know who you're praying to. I mean, you've got the sun and the trees and the river and the rocks and love. And we could just go on and on. But, but to this one, it's just, you don't know? So he says to them, I can see that you are ignorant of the very thing you worship. Now, us, we read that and we kind of we get defensive, right? Like ignorant. Who are you calling an ignorant, right? You know, what's, what's wrong with you? But that's not the way Paul meant it. He meant it in the way of saying, I, I can see that you're unsure. I can see that you, you don't know. You don't have all the answers. You're admitting you don't have all the answers. Let's just do this as crowd participation, if you will. Would anybody be willing to admit that you don't have all the answers? Yeah, see, you're in the same boat as the Athenians. We're all in this boat together. We all experience this. Here's what Paul's basically saying. I can see that you're guessing. You're guessing. You're just trying to make sure. I mean, just in case you miss it, right? Because they believed that the gods would honor certain things and show favor and do good to people if the people did good to the gods. He says, so I, can, I get it. I totally understand what you're doing. You're saying, hey, if, in case I missed it, I don't want to anger the god that might smite me, right? Or might strike me with lightning or strike me with a plague. So Paul says, I get this. But you have to identify this. There's a part of us, this curiosity, and we don't have all the answers. And we shouldn't pretend like we do. He continues, he says, so I can see that you are ignorant of the very thing that you worship. And this, this ignorance, this lack of knowledge is what I'm going to proclaim to you. Gentile people, Greek people, 
philosophers who have no context, many of them with Jewish history, the Old Testament, the Bible stories you grew up on. They don't know Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They don't know David or Jonah. They have no idea. How and what would Paul stand up and preach to a group of people who, just like we said, what if we didn't know anything? Of all the things we could teach, what would we say? Here's Paul and what he said. He said, the God who made the world and everything in it is the Lord of heaven and earth and does not live in temples built by human hands. I can see that you're religious. I can see that you're searching, but I want you to know something. This God that I'm talking about is bigger than everything you see here. He created everything and everything in it, including you. He's the Lord of heaven, of the cosmos, the things you can't see. And he's Lord, he's, he's master over everything you can. And he does not live in temples. These temples you've built for a God. If you got a God who lives in a temple, that's not much of a God, okay? If he's going to, you know, need you to build him a house to reside in, then that's not much of a God. He continues and he says, and he is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. You guys are making these sacrifices and you're going out here trying to make sure that you appease these gods. You know, you, you got to give to them and these gods then in return because you're good to them will do something good for you. And he says, no, that's not the way this God works. He is complete within himself. He doesn't need you to provide for him. In fact, it's actually the other way around. He says, and he, this God, is not served by human hands as if he needed anything. Rather, he himself gives everyone life and breath and everything else. Nothing you have comes from your own doing. It all is sourced from this God. He continues, he says, and from one man... He made all the nations. He's going right back to Adam. Didn't name him specifically, no, but he says, I want you to understand, God created mankind, and from this one man, we are all connected. We are all related. We all have access. That's what he's trying to say, because when you grew up in, in a Greek world, in the Roman world, if you were Greek or Roman, you were something. But if you weren't, you were a barbarian. They would call you barbaros. You were a nobody. You were uncivilized and uncultured. He says, no, 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 you have to understand, we're all on the same playing field. God created us all so that they should inhabit the whole earth. And he marked out their appointed times in history and the boundaries of their lands. Nothing happens by chance with God. Every civilization has come and gone. And oh yeah, philosophers, remember when you, Greece, was, you know, you were the bad boys on the block. Well, when Rome showed up, <laughs> it's their time now. So you should understand this. Every dog has their day, so to speak. Don't think too highly of yourself because God has allowed and appointed the boundaries and history is determined by him. He continues and says, God did this so that they would seek him. He has shown his majesty and his lordship so that people would seek him and perhaps reach out for him and find him though he is not far from any one of us. I mean, think about what he's saying. To a group that believed in a pantheon of gods, to philosophers that believed that God, and, and, and some philosophers believed that God didn't interact with humans. Others believed that the gods played with the humans. They toyed with the humans. They would come down to the earth and take humans as their brides and grooms. They would play with them like pieces of a, a, a game, or a board game or a puzzle. And he says, this God, he it, it doesn't reduce himself down to the level of man. He's so much greater and so much bigger. And in fact, he wants you to seek him. He wants you to find him. He wants you to reach out for him. He's not far from you. He wants to be known. And then I love what Paul does next. He uses their own words of ancient philosophers in his explanation. He says, for in him we live and move and have our being." It's not that Epimenides, the guy I told you about with the sheep, it's not this Cretan philosopher that he believed in the God that Paul believed in, but he's using these words to say, this truth that you've heard before actually echoes to be true when this God, this all-powerful, all-knowing creator, God who loves you, who's looking for you. And as some of your own poets have also said, we are his offspring. That's Aratus, the Sicilian Stoic philosopher, so one of the Stoic philosophers. So these guys that were sitting here debating with Paul would have known these things. They would have known these quotes. And like, wait a minute. 
how does this guy know about the quotes of our own philosophers? I mean, he's learned, he's, he's educated, he, he knows his stuff. Paul was familiar with the culture that he was investing in and that he was preaching to. So Paul says, even your own philosophers, some of their truth agrees with what I'm telling you. He continues and says, so therefore, since we are God's offspring, why? Because God created man and all men come from that man. We should not think that the divine being is like gold or silver or stone, an image made by human design and skill. You have all these altars, you have all these temples, there's all these statues and you worship these things and you think that these are gods. These are images of these gods and they're not. God created all things. Don't worship the creation when you have access to the creator. You should not think this way. And now Paul is going to start to work on their hearts and their minds. He continues and he says, In the past, God overlooked such ignorance, lack of understanding, lack of knowledge in this. God overlooked it. You didn't know. Before Christ came, you didn't know the fullness of God's plan. But now that Christ has come, and we learn this in the book of Romans, when Paul is speaking to Roman believers, much like he would here with these Greeks, when the time of Christ now has come, God expects all people to turn to Jesus. He says at one time God overlooked such ignorance, but now, now at this appointed time, things are different. He commands all people everywhere to repent. And you, you might think, oh, there it is. Paul's telling them to repent of their sin, right? And, and that's actually not what Paul is even talking about yet. Anytime we hear the word repent, that's where we go. You need to repent from your sin. And then we go, well, what's sin? Have you ever met anybody that didn't know much about the concept of sin? It's, it's amazing because we, we understand it. We've been taught that disobedience and disregard for God's law and his perfect will and all those things. But Paul's not talking about that. He's saying if we are God's offspring, we have an accountability and a responsibility to worship this God and to, and to serve him, not because he needs anything, but because he's worthy of this. And he says now we must repent. We must change the way that we think. That's what the word repent means, to think differently. You have to begin to think differently. You've got to change your approach to God. You can't approach God like you approach these other gods, this belief system that you grew up in, because it's false. The God that you should serve, the one true God, he's bigger than all those ideas that you grew up with. You need to change the way you think. And you know what Paul didn't do right now with this? He's not trying to convince them. He's just stating the truth. You need to change the way you think. You need to change what you believe. Paul's responsibility was not to change this people. His responsibility was just to tell them the gospel. The Holy Spirit went before Paul. Scripture teaches us that. And when Paul would speak truth and the Holy Spirit and this truth, they would testify one with another. And we're going to see the result of that. Paul goes on to say this. We should be thinking differently and we need to repent. Why? Because this God is going to hold you accountable. This God has set a day when he will judge the world with justice. And every single person, philosopher sitting there, knew what justice was. They knew what right and wrong was based on justice. And they had a moral compass, so to speak. It wasn't like ours, and you don't need to think that it was. It was quite different, their, their makeup and their, the composition of their morality at that time. But they knew what justice was. They had seen it in the courtrooms. They loved court. They loved the law. The Greeks... Loved their gatherings and to vote. They were one of the first civilizations with democracy. Please understand that. They understood what justice was about. But he says God's going to bring about justice by the man that he has appointed. And this man, of course, who he's talking to or talking about is Jesus. So he looks at these Athenian philosophers. God's going to bring judgment through this man, and it's going to be judgment. It's going to be the right judgment. And he says he has given us proof. Of this. He's given proof of this to everyone, to which those philosophers were eating that. I know they had to be, because they're like, oh, wait a minute, this isn't just philosophy anymore. Now there's proof, there's evidence. I mean, that's what we're looking for. We sit around here every single day just wandering and, and, and asking questions, but you have proof of this? This is amazing. What is the proof? And we love proof. You love proof. You ask for proof all the time. Why? Because proof is something for us that helps solidify ideas. Proof moves us from hope so to no so, and every single one of us like that. 
In fact, this is something that God wants to reveal for all of us. He says, in the end, as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 13, in the end, all that will be left is love because there will be no need for hope because what you were hoping for you will have obtained and there will be no need for faith because the things you couldn't see, now you see and now you know. Proof. And the philosophers, ah, yes, give us this proof. And here's what he says. He has given this proof to everyone by raising him, this man, Jesus, from the dead. Remember what I told you, though. These philosophers, Stoic and Epicurean philosophers, they didn't believe in the resurrection of the dead. But because of Paul's message, something powerful and amazing took place. Because he was so bold, right, to preach the truth. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead from Paul, they fell on their knees and repented and set about destroying their idols and their altars. That's actually not what happened at all. I just put that in there, and some of y'all didn't even know that wasn't what happened. But not at all. That's what we want to happen, right? That's what we wish would happen. We hope that when we go out and we tell somebody about Jesus that everything changes in the moment. We have done our job. We have spoken it eloquently. We have convinced them, and they are going to change because we have told them the truth, right? Are you just going back home and love your wife and love your husband, love your kids, and go to work and be trustworthy and loyal, all those things, right? We just expect people to just respond like this. Why wouldn't you? I mean, we've told you the truth. Here's what really happened. When they heard about the resurrection of the dead, some of them sneered. If you've ever gone out and spoken the gospel to anybody that wasn't ready for it, you'll get a sneer. You'll get somebody, oh, (laughs) resurrection, (laughs) yep. You're like every other kook who's been in here to talk to us about this. Okay. He's given us proof. He's given us evidence. Somebody raised from the dead. Listen, Paul, in our experience, dead people stay what? Yeah, your experience too, right? Dead people stay dead, Paul. We, uh, other people have tried, Paul, but thanks. Thanks for coming. You can see yourself out. But others said, we want to hear you again on this subject. Others, the second group said, we think you might be onto something. We still have questions, though. We'd like to know more. And yet a third group at that, it says Paul left the council. And after leaving the presence of the council, some of the people became followers of Paul and they believed in the gospel of Christ. Three totally different groups of people. The exact same three groups of people that you will experience any time that you want to share the gospel. But you do understand that these three groups of people didn't end up like they are or or their reaction because of anything that Paul did. It had everything to do with their mind and their heart and the condition of their heart. It had everything to do with their willingness to repent, to open up, to believe something new. It had everything to do with the influence of the Holy Spirit in working in their lives at that moment. And the same thing is even true today. As we share the truth about Jesus, we just simply state the truth. That truth is Christ. Do you understand that? The Spirit of God is the Spirit of Christ. And when that truth interacts with the Spirit of God, it testifies, as I've told you already twice this morning. And it's God who changes people. Not Paul. Not me. Not you. Here's the summary of Paul's message to this group. God created all things, whether you find that to be true or not. I'm just I'm telling you the truth. God created everything. God cares about all people. We come from him. We are his offspring. Every single person comes from him. God revealed himself in this person of Jesus, sending Jesus to the earth. And we learn that that's part of Paul's story from what he taught in Berea to believer, or non-believers there, Gentiles there. And then God raised Jesus from the dead and will judge the world accordingly. That's the simple message that Paul taught. And he didn't feel like he had to go around and convince everybody of it. His job was just to tell people about it and let God do his work. The simple thing that Paul was introducing to the people to become the foundation of their faith, the starting point of their faith, was not something that they would find written about at that time. But in fact, it was an event, the resurrection of Christ. And then he would present to the people, for them to determine the answer to the most important question, the starting point, truly, of all of our faith. The question is simply, who is Jesus? 
Who is Jesus? Who is this first century rabbi, self-proclaimed rabbi, Jewish carpenter who never wrote a book, never traveled more than 100 miles from his hometown, never raised an army, and in fact was only a public figure for less than four years and was crucified by Rome? Who is this Jewish carpenter whose teachings are still taught nearly 2,000 years later, whose teachings have shaped and molded thought and philosophy for the entire world nearly 2,000 years later. Everything we do, everything that our society, especially Western society, is about, you have to understand, has been influenced by Christ. Our morality, our sense of right and wrong and what we ought to do and, and what we shouldn't do, all of that was influenced by Jesus. He taught radical things that in the face of a Greco-Roman world were, were ridiculous. Why would you do for someone else when they couldn't do anything back for you? That seems so selfless. That's so empty. He would teach people to love and have compassion for enemies, not just the people who were like them. He would teach such radical generosity that he would say would change the landscape of society, but, you know, but we can't get past it because we're greedy. And he would say, no, you don't need to be greedy. You need to be generous. You need to love people. You need to treat people the way that I've treated you. And he set an example and a tone by revealing who the Father, who this God that Paul was talking about is. And he would say, in the same words that I've spoken to you, that's how you need to speak to each other. And in the same way that I, that I act with you and I respond to you, that's how you need to respond with your brothers and sisters. But you need to understand that this God is good and this God is just. And just as much as he loves you, he is a just, righteous God. And there will be a judgment. And you need to be ready for it. But you can't get ready on your own. The only way you get ready for this judgment is by wrestling with this question of who is Jesus. And Jesus would look at his followers at one time and he would say, guys, who am I? Tell me who I am. And Peter, I believe that you're the Messiah. I believe that you're the son of the living God. You are the sacrifice. You are the one who's going to change everything. And he says, Peter, you couldn't speak those words if it wasn't for my father in heaven. The answer to who is Jesus, the truth about who is Jesus, comes from our Father in heaven. He's the reason you can speak it. It's not because you just choose it for yourself. It's the moving of the Spirit of God in your life. Who is Jesus? There's only three answers to that. I pulled up four when I said three, so <clears throat> I'm not good at math, evidently. Only three answers to that. He's a liar. He obviously knew he wasn't the son of God, but he proclaimed it anyway, right? He's a liar. He was a lunatic. He really believed his own lies, right? I mean, he believed his own story. He was crazy. Or he's the Lord. And what he said was true. And the reason we know anything about him at all is because he really did rise from the dead and his people, his followers who had abandoned their faith were now newly restored in their faith and willing to go to their death and some 25 years later would turn the whole world upside down with his teachings. But it wasn't his teachings. It wasn't his teachings that Paul even talked about to the Athenian believers. It was an event. It was a moment when God raised Jesus from the dead, that resurrection that punctuates everything that Jesus taught and leads us to answer that question of who is Jesus. And I hope you have an answer for it. And that's where I'm going to kind of leave you today on this cliffhanger. Who is Jesus? If you don't have an answer that's readily available for people in your life, then you need to find an answer. You need to develop one. You need to pray about it because that's your story. Who is Jesus? And it helps you tell the story of your life and maybe your childhood starting point and maybe even your adulthood starting point. So here's a couple questions maybe for discussion to help you get this right. How and when did you begin your faith journey? This is what I want you to ask with your family. Maybe over lunch today, if you have a small group, if you have a Bible study, just pause and say, hey guys, I got a question for you. How and when did you begin your faith journey? Tell me your story. I want to learn from it. And two, how well has your faith held up under the rigors of life? Or have you found that you had to make some adjustments? You had to pivot. You had to grow. 
And if you did, maybe your story of growth will help to impact somebody else's story of growth. And you never know where that might lead to somebody answering the question. Say it with me. Who is Jesus? Amen. And for you today, if you've heard the truth, something stirred up within you. Maybe for a long time you've debated, you've wondered, and you thought, I don't really know the step that I need to take. If that's you, maybe you're watching online. And we want you to know that that's the Lord tugging on your heart. That's the Lord telling you that you need to take that step and be open. You need to repent. Change the way that you think and believe. Open up your heart to truth. And then you need to pursue that truth because the more you do, the more the Spirit will speak to you and change you and guide you. And then he'll use you in somebody else's life to do the same. And we want to know about it. And we want to walk with you every single step of the way. We want to empower you and equip you to be the person that God's called you to be in Christ. So at this time, I'm going to pray. And, and as I pray, I'm going to ask that, that Hannah and Carmen come up. Because this morning, as we said, we get to celebrate with the baptism of a young lady who has answered this question in her life. And she's known the answer for a long time. But it's when the Spirit really moves in you. When it, when it gets a hold of you and it begins to testify. Come on up. That things begin to change. So I'm going to pray. They're going to make their way up. And then Hannah is going to share with you a little bit about Carmen because Hannah is her small group leader, which is amazing, uh, on Wednesday night and Inside Out. And then um, we'll see Carmen's baptism video, and then we will get to participate and celebrate with her in her baptism. Father, we love you, and we thank you for this morning. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your mercy and, 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 Father, your grace in our lives. We thank you for wisdom. We thank you for preserving these stories and these texts about your son and, and about your church and about life, just about all of the blessings that you have given, about the change that you have made in this world. We thank you for the wisdom that comes from these stories, from this history, from this real life encounters that people have had with your son and with your people. And Father, we pray this morning for the hearts and minds of those who have heard the truth. And Father, that the spirit would move and lead and guide. It would convict them. And that they truly would repent and be open to you and to, to the truth of, of your word that brings life change. And we pray, Father, this morning for Carmen as she has taken that step in her life and, and now today is going public with her faith to tell the whole world about the change that you have made inside of her. And we are so excited to celebrate with her. But Father, we continue to give you praise and thanks for your son Jesus, for sending him on our behalf for making a way to atone for the gap and the distance that was created through our sin, through our disobedience, and Father, through the nature that was within us as we're born into this, that you would renew all of that, that you would fix all of that. I just pray that you would speak to our hearts and our minds today as we celebrate with this young person and their decision to follow your son. and Father, that they have been restored now to you to become one of your children, part of your kingdom, part of your family. Lord, we love you and we thank you and we praise you. And it's in the matchless name of your son, Jesus, that we pray these things. Everybody said, amen. 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 Hello. There we go. This is Carmen. <laughs> Come on, let's go. Come on, let's go. Um, I feel extremely excited today. Um, for those of you who don't know Carmen, she, um, as beautiful as she is on the outside, God has crafted such an incredibly more beautiful heart within her. Um, I've had the privilege of um, being her small group leader in youth, and um, she's special. <laughs> um, I'll keep this short and sweet because, honestly, I don't even have the words to describe how excited and how proud I am of Carmen um, she's a natural leader, and that is why today is finally so exciting. Um, she so naturally exemplifies the fruits of the Spirit in her life and everything that she does. Um, and it's so exciting because just as Derek was saying, she gets it. <laughs> she gets that she has to depend on God in every aspect of her life. Um, and She's going to be, <laughs> um, we always tell the youth that they have such an incredible opportunity at this age while they're in school and even thinking about college, that they're in a mission field where they're at right now. Um, and that is a reason to celebrate today because she is standing here today 
saying to you that she's putting her full faith and trust in everything that she does in God, that she's accepting the plan that, sh- that he has for her life, and now she's going to take that back um, and be that light to everyone around her. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, awesome. We'll give her a big hand. All right, so at, at this time, Carmen's going to make her way back uh, with Mr. Matt, and they're going to get prepared and you get to share in her story. Uh, now, Carmen this week came in, and uh, we recorded a, a video for her, and it's just her little bit of her story that she wants to share with you uh, so that you can be part of this moment today. So take a look. Hi, my name is Carmen Kendiff. I grew up in a Christian home where we prayed morning and night, read the Bible, and went to church. I always knew God was my Lord and Savior, but I had really never made the decision to commit my life to Jesus. A few months ago in June, Matt took six girls to church camp in Tennessee. I grew my relationship with God so much. The second night we were there, the whole camp did prayer and worship together. It was so powerful. In small group that night, Matt asked us, has anybody made any important decisions? When it got to my turn, it didn't take me but seconds to say, I got saved. Getting saved was something I've wanted to do for years, but I've never really felt a connection as closely as I did in that moment. All of my worries, all of my fears, all of my problems were suddenly in God's hands. It was the biggest weight off of my shoulders. The next night we were all in the room again together and the theme of the week was subscribing to Jesus. So there was this big subscribe button on the stage and she said, the host said, if you made a big decision this week, come up and push the button. So, without hesitating, I went up there, and it made this noise that I will remember for a lifetime.
Excellent. It is always a joy, isn't it, to see a young person, especially uh, who has been invested in and people have given their time and they've loved and uh, has come from a home that has taught her about Christ and they give their life to Jesus. It's an incredible. So here's what we're going to ask that you do. Hang around for a minute. We're going to end service here and end service for people online. Hang around. Stick around. Make sure that you tell her congratulations. Welcome her into the family with a big hug. Maybe she'll like that. I hope she'll like that. But uh, it comes from a good place. Um, but yeah, stick around. Let Carmen know just how important of a decision this is. And maybe even share with her your story and tell her how her story interacts with yours. And uh, she is now on a journey. This is not the end. This is the beginning. This is the beginning of a lifetime, of a journey with Christ. And so uh, with that being said, we just want to say thank you for being here this morning. If you have any questions, anything at all that, that you, you know, seen, heard today that stirs something within you, maybe you'd like to go out and, and visit the table for UCSS, our uh, global mission partner, Uganda Counseling and Support Services. Please make sure you go out and see that. But we love you. God bless you. Have a wonderful rest of your day. And we'll see you again next week for part two of Starting Point.